Let's pray and let's get into the topic we have for our first breakout session. Father, thank you, Lord, for this room, for a chance to speak about important matters, to share with one another, to understand the truth of your word. I thank you for each man and woman who's made time to be here, Lord. For um, Most of all, Father, I, I thank you for your word. I thank you for its uh, integrity, for the way in which it proves itself to us, and that the truth of it, Father, is so self-evident to anyone who has given, them, given themselves over to it that it, it needs no defense. Uh, what we need to do, Father, is take it in and become more like it so that we can defend the truth through our person. And in doing that, Father, honor you and glorify you. And we want to do that better, Lord, so I want you to, to give me the words for them and for us all to have the understanding we need to, um, to divide rightly the word and to identify those who don't. Uh, so that we may be protected from their negative influence and we may help others escape it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, welcome. We're here to talk about false teachers. Uh, we, we could do this in a lot of different ways. We could talk about you know, individuals or we could talk about some of the f false teachings that are out there. And you know, we could talk about the damage that it does in the church. And there's a lot of ways we could attack this conversation about false teaching in the church. But the goal of these sessions across the board is to equip and sometimes you you're best equipped by becoming more aware of something that's going on or how to understand something that's going on other times you're better equipped by being given very specific responses things you can do techniques uh, I tend to favor the latter so this session and the one I do uh, secondly the other one I do on apologetics toolbox both of these are designed to equip to give you something very specific you can act on think about do and in this case it's, a, it's an awareness set of tools. It's a knowledge of how the false teachers ply their trade and how they are able to convince millions of people about something that is plainly wrong and not in the Bible at all and often contradicted in Scripture very plainly. And if you're a student of Scripture and you see these things happening, you may ask yourself, how can anyone fall for this stuff? It seems so obviously bad. Uh, well, the problem is a lot of people don't have that insight. A lot of Christians have not been trained up in the Bible well enough to have that insight. I have to believe the kind of person who comes to a conference like this represents a certain uh, strata within the demographics of Christendom. A certain kind of person comes here. And not exclusively, but I mean in general. And as a result, I would expect you might be one of those people that others in the faith turn to at times for counsel, for understanding of Scripture. Maybe someone uh, that is being looked up to as a student or a teacher of Scripture. And if that's you, you want to be prepared to help others understand when they're being fooled by bad teaching. Uh, you're going to have an opportunity to do that at some point. Uh, maybe others of you aren't quite as familiar with Scripture, aren't as accomplished in st study. You're still in the process of learning, which would be great. Uh, now you have a chance to hopefully learn some things maybe for your own sake, to stay away from some of the bad teaching. Uh, let's start with Scripture. Well, since we're talking about Scripture, let's start with Scripture. Paul says to Timothy when he was talking to him about uh, the nature of their job as pastors and teachers, he said, oops, here we go. He said that Timothy was to be diligent, that he was to present himself as a workman of Scripture. Uh, you might think of someone who works in iron as a, uh, a smith, a blacksmith. Well, someone who works with the words of Scripture is another form of workman. And that workman is to be approved by their boss, who is the Lord, ultimately. And that workman should have on his mind or her mind the desire that, or on their heart, this desire to not make mistakes, certainly not out of carelessness or not out of greed or any other uh, uh, intentional act but should be working very hard to be right about what they believe and what they teach, accurately handling the word of truth so as not to be ashamed by what they do. That's what Paul's asking in fewer words. That word is, uh, accurately handling is actually one word in Greek, and that work is orthomeo. Orthomeo means to cut a straight line like the way a carpenter is to measure twice and cut once when working with wood. The idea is that once you cut that wood, it's, it's done. You can't fix it if you did it wrong. So get it right the first time. Accurately handling conveys that sense of a workman who's proud of the work they do, conscientious about the work they do, and understands what's at risk if they do it wrongly. That's the goal. What we're here to talk about are people who have nothing like that on their mind. That is the furthest from their goal. Their goal has nothing to do with honoring God, has nothing to do with being approved by God, 
certainly isn't interested in accurately handling the Word of God. In fact, their goal is to manipulate it for their own purposes. And whether they've sat down one day and thought like that out loud and planned the whole scheme, or whether they were just, you know, found themselves doing this out of habit or out of bad teaching that they received or whatever, doesn't matter. These people are out there doing this kind of thing. Let me show you some of the tricks they're using. The first one, and I think what I would have to tell you is the most common one, is to take something out of its proper context. We're going to talk about that. Secondly, they apply what they read without interpreting what they've read. This is a great technique for taking the scriptures places it was never intended to go. Thirdly, they turn description into prescription, another way to slyly manipulate scripture. And in some cases you'll see, and this is starting to become a little more common because of the availability, I think, of, of software tools. More and more pastors are starting to play with Hebrew and Greek in some very unhelpful ways. Meaning they, well, we'll show you some examples. I'm going to show you examples of all of these, and in the case of three of the four, I'm going to show you videos of people doing it. And you'll get to see it for yourself. Let's start with what is clearly the number one cause of, of a lot of pain and suffering in the church, and that is taking things out of context. I think we all can do this without realizing it. It doesn't mean that you're and necessarily trying to deceive someone. In fact, it's very easy to take something out of context. You take things out of context when you don't try not to. Does that make sense? When you're not clearly trying to be careful, you just take something, you think you know what it means, you haven't really double checked your own work, you quote it and then you tell someone what it means and you're wrong, but you don't know you're wrong because you haven't really done the homework. What do I mean by context? Let's start with that idea, context. Context means that in the course of teaching, and let's say this is a letter from somewhere in the epistles, some passage in the epistles. Whoever wrote this had some thought in their head. They were going down some line of analysis. They were talking to the church in some fashion about some topic. And they're building. They're thinking through their argument. They're bringing you somewhere in their analysis. And that whole line of thought, as far back as you have to go, might be a paragraph or a page, or it might be the whole book. But there's some context there, some larger background that they're working from. And if you read it from front to back, verse by verse, the context will show itself to you as you walk through the text in the way the author intended you to. But that's not always something we need to do. Sometimes we just want to go to a, a summary idea, a main point somewhere, and use it in application of some teaching. And that's perfectly appropriate. Just make sure that you make the point that the author himself was making. You don't make some other point with their words. That's keeping it in its context. When you take something out of context, this is what it would mean fundamentally. It would mean going through the text and picking out pieces like that. And those pieces are not directly related to one another. So this is context, and this is out of context. Now you notice how closely related they are. They're not far apart, they're in the same book. But if I cherry pick ideas and I smash them together, absent what came between it. I can make all kinds of things happen. Have you ever taken an audio, um, like a, a recorded audio track of someone's voice, or ever heard or seen someone doing this, where they take snippets of the voice out and sandwich it together, next thing that you know, the person's saying something they didn't actually say? That's effectively the same thing you're doing here if you use their words in written form and you smash them together. When I want to say something I want to say and it's not said by the Bible, that's not a problem. I can find the snippets I need that will say what I want to say, and then I tell you that the Bible said it. And you don't know any different if you're not careful because what I read came from the Bible. But what you may have noticed or not noticed is that I created a line of thought of my own. That's taking text out of context. When you do that, it's pretext. Pretext is a way of saying it is a, an effort on my part to lead you somewhere that was not intended by the author. And this is a common technique, and I don't just mean among some of the let's say the worst of the worst. There are well-meaning pastors in pulpits every Sunday who, um, let, let me say this, let me put it this way. If you have a teacher teaching you and they give you one, one verse and they teach you for 40 minutes or 20 minutes on one verse, how do you know if they're using the verse properly or not? They're telling you what they think it means, but how do you know? How do you know that's what the author of the verse meant? And the only way you would know is if you flip to the place they pulled that verse from and read about, you know, 14 paragraphs before and about 10 paragraphs after and see if what they said about what that verse meant 
is accurate given what the author was talking about at the time. How many Christians do that? Certainly few would do it in the moment, and maybe the, in the moment isn't the right time anyway, but to do it later, who goes back and does it later? That's the question, and that's why false teaching is prevalent, because they know you won't, or they, they assume you won't. You have to do your homework. It's a common tactic among false teachers. Let me um, let's see if I can get my thing to work here. There we go. Let me take you through a checklist of some things you want to watch for with context. We're not going to use a video for this example. I'm going to use one of my own examples and then have you work it with me. But here's the things you ought to be checking for. When that pastor gets up on Sunday and quotes that one verse, did they start by giving you the writer's overall message or purpose? Did they summarize for you what that context was? Which might be an, eff an effective way for them to catch you up into the text. Where, where was this text going before we dropped in on it? They should do that. If they don't tell you where, what's going on around it, you should start to wonder. Um, do they offer the historical and cultural background? One of the things I try to do a lot in my own teaching is tell you a little bit about the times, the circumstances, the author, the, the audience, because all of that background determines the context. I write very differently if I'm writing to an audience that's living under persecution versus one that's fat, dumb, and happy. That changes what I'm going to say, and it changes the meaning of what I'm saying, and those things have to be understood. Uh, you want to see that done. Did the interpretation follow from the writer's own logical argument? You can see the writer thinking through an argument, A, B, C, D, and they're headed somewhere. Did the teacher take the author's logical progression and go with it, or did they go against it somehow? And then lastly, was that interpretation consistent with Scripture's overall teaching? If I go to a book like Hebrews that has some controversial passages in it that are often debated, and I tell you that the passage means such and such, for example, I tell you this passage teaches you can lose your salvation, you should be able to reject that teaching out of hand because you know that's not what the Bible says generally. I've come to a conclusion that is contradicted by other scripture, i.e. I can't be right. Whatever else I'm going to say about it, I can't be right on that. You need to understand whether what I'm saying as a teacher is consistent with scripture overall. If all of those things are true, then what you're seeing is somebody who's... Um, so my battery, I think my battery is almost dead. No problem. Then you know you have somebody you need to be concerned about. So let's do a classic example. This is an example many of you have probably already heard about or seen. Luke chapter 6, where Jesus says, Give and it will be given to you. They will pour it into your lap. You've read this before, heard this before. They will pour it into your lap, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Yeah, it's actually... Uh, Two double A's, triple A's? Nope. I've got more. I'll do it after the session. Thank you very much, though. All right, so we've, who here has heard this teaching or heard this verse quoted in some context as a part of a teaching? Why is this so common? When you've heard it, how many of you have heard it as part of a larger context? Like somebody read a whole passage and this just happened to be in the middle of it. Is that how you heard it? Was it all read by itself? Yes. Do you know why it was read by itself? Because if I read the whole passage, I couldn't tell you what I really want to say. <laughs> what do I want to say? If I'm a false teacher, what kind of thing would I want to say about this verse? It's like the prosperity gospel. It's the prosperity gospel. What, what, what is it that catches your eye in this? Give me money, you'll get money. Back. Well, yeah, so where is the, do you see the word money in there? No. No, what do you see? What, what word would, you, would it, right? Isn't it the whole point? But you notice that it is a pronoun? You should notice that. So, all right, she didn't notice that, but most of you noticed that. <laughs> it. So if I have a pronoun, what do I need to do if I want to understand what it is? Yeah, the antecedent of the, of, of the pronoun. What is the proper noun that is being referred to? In itself, that little word, it, being a pronoun, demands that I look at the context, doesn't it? The writer had already said what it was, and now he's moved on to talking about it. And he's expecting us to know what it is because we would have read it a few verses earlier. But if I take it out of context and I don't tell you what it is, what is it? Well, as somebody just said a minute ago, it becomes this. But maybe he's talking about cats. Maybe he's talking about vacations. Maybe he's talking about who knows what he's talking about. Whatever it is, there's some transaction taking place with it. How many of you have heard it talked about in terms of money? All right, every single one of you who just heard that, wherever you heard it, you listen to a false teacher. Not necessarily an unbeliever, not necessarily an evil man or woman, but you listen to someone 
who taught something falsely, whether because they knew it themselves to be false and they had ulterior motives, or because they were mistaught, or because they were not informed properly. That's not what this verse is talking about. In fact, it's so obviously not what it's talking about that it, it actually calls into question someone's integrity because if they had read one verse above it, they would know it wasn't talking about money. And the fact that they would show you this and say it's talking about money really calls into question their heart, doesn't it? Because either they are a scholar of the word that is so poor they don't even read one more verse above the one they're teaching, which is almost criminal, or they knew that if they did that, they couldn't do what they wanted, which means it's worse than criminal. <laughs> so what does the verse actually say? Let's just put it in its context. Just scanning through that, I'm not going to read the whole thing for time, but just scanning through that, what do you find? What's the general theme there? Pardoning, forgiveness, lack of judgment. Do you see money anywhere? <laughs> Any conversation about wealth whatsoever? What do you see? Be merciful, do not judge, do not be judged. Now look at the transactions in the verse ahead of it. Because there was a transaction implied by give and it will come back to you, right? What is the transactional context? Give pardon, you'll be pardoned. Yeah. What is it? Judgment, forgiveness, or pardoning, right? The, con the transactions are entirely about how we treat people in a certain specific way. That is with respect to our sinning against them or their sinning against us. And now, if I told you that, hey, if you forgive people, they'll be more willing to forgive you, does that shock you? <laughs> Don't we tell our kids that? Jesus just said the same thing. It's not that it's not important to know that. My point is, it's not like some revolutionary discovery in the center of the Bible, hidden for ages, only to be recovered now. Oh, if you give money, God will make you rich. That's complete nonsense. It's not true to the context, not at all. It's not true to the Bible, not at all. There's nothing in the scripture that says believers will be rich, and history self-evidently proves the opposite. Right? It's harder for a rich man to get into heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Jesus' fundamental point is, if you love this world more than the next, you're not going to have a very happy, successful, blessed life. In fact, it may get in the way of your salvation. So, it's a complete backwards look at Scripture, a pandering to the, to the sin of the human heart that wants to be told it can be rich. It's just complete nonsense. And the fact that someone could use this verse when its context is so clearly different is evidence to you of how easily we can be manipulated by people who want to if we're not making an effort to study the Bible. That's just one example. The other ones we're going to do more quickly only because I have a video that self-incriminates in every case. And the next one is application without interpretation. And it's built on an understanding of how basic interpretation of Scripture should take place. In a three-step process that many of you probably know from your other studies, from your other work in Bible study, there's basically three good steps that get you through the Bible properly. The first is observing the text in an accurate way, being very careful to notice pronouns, for example. The, the things that are being said, don't run past it too quickly, make careful note of what's being said in the text. From there, secondly, you want to interpret what those things mean. Now the interpretation is not of your own, it's trying to arrive at an explanation of what the writer was trying to say. All right, by what they said, what did they mean? And from what I gather in their meaning, I now look to myself and understand what is God asking of me in response to what he just said is true. So let's say it in a little different way. What does the text say? Leads me then to what does that mean? Then leading me to, from there, still over here, what does the text require of me? All right, it's very simple, isn't it? But if you mess up this process, or let's say more specifically, if you cut a step out, you can do anything you want with the text and, and convince people that you're telling them the truth. For example, if I take out that step, what do I do? Well, I tell you, let's read verse whatever on Sunday morning, and we all open our Bibles and we read the verse and it's up on the screen, and then the very next thing I do is I say, here's what we should do. So I might read the verse from Luke 6, and then I'd follow immediately after reading it by saying, we need to give more money. Never did I stop and explain what Luke 6 is actually about. Never did I actually interpret the, the passage. I just read it. I sort of let it stay up there. And in a manipulative way, I let you make some bad assumptions of your own, and I didn't work to correct them. I let them 
stand so that I could use them. So I put one verse by itself, I let you read it, your natural mind is, I give and I get, maybe he's talking about money, and he lets you hold that thought and he runs directly into an application of it. That is observation without interpretation, so that I can move to an application. Again, a lot of people do this and they don't even realize they're doing it. They're not necessarily trying to deceive you, they're just bad at their job. They read a verse and then they have their three-point sermon with a joke at the beginning and a, and a tearjerker at the end. And there's never anywhere in the middle of that sermon where they actually say, let's try to understand what that text is actually talking about. They run right to an application. It's bad hermeneutics and it's bad homiletics and it's what stands for a lot of preaching these days. But the problem with it is, even if I don't mean badly, I'm bound to make mistakes doing that because I'm not grounding my ap application in what the text meant. I'm free to go anywhere my mind takes me at that point. It's a very dangerous method. Let me show you an example. Well, first of all, let me give you a quote from John MacArthur, who's a great expert in this area, in my opinion. He's often railing against this stuff in his own writing. He says, truth is never de determined by looking at God's word and asking, what does it mean to me? That's effectively what we're talking about. I read it, and then I say, what does it mean to me? Whenever I hear someone talk like that, I'm inclined to ask, what does the Bible mean before you existed? What does God mean by what he says? Those are the proper questions to be asking. Truth and meaning are not determined by our intuition or our experience or desire. The true meaning of scripture, or anything else for that matter, has already been determined and fixed by the mind of God. The task of the interpreter is to discern that meaning and proper interpretation must precede application. If you pay attention to this when you listen to other teachers, you will be shocked perhaps at how often People are preaching to you with no interpretation. They're not telling you why the text is telling them what to say to you. And if you do that, you start to become a, a cynic of sorts because you start to realize how much stuff is out there. Let me give you an example. I'm going to use the text and then I'm going to show you somebody on video. Another text that's frequently quoted within the context of money. Malachi, where uh, the Lord sp speaks to Israel in Malachi. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me, but you say, how have we robbed you? And the Lord replies, well, in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house, and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Now, let's say I just read that to you, and then I jump past interpretation, because that's what I want to do, and I go directly to application, what might you expect to hear me say next? This is our giving week. This is our campaign month. And I launch into, here's our plans for the church, here's our needs. And in other words, I'm totally on to some specific thing I want to talk about. I've read the verse and I've moved past it in a second and it's become window dressing for some point I want to make. And what I've done is I've let you think that God is asking for, from you the thing I'm asking from you that my request is God's request. Why? Because God just said it. But wait a minute, Pastor, that wasn't written to me. I mean, he was speaking to Israel. Yes, it's in the Bible. Yes, I can benefit from it, but that doesn't mean it was spit, written to me. God did not look down the corridors of time as he wrote that to Israel and say, when Steve reads this, he'll give money to the church. That's not what the interpretation would have for this verse. In fact, I really need to go understand when did this get written? What was going on in Israel when it was written? What was God asking of Israel? Why was Israel required to do this? If it's under the law, am I under the law? If I'm not under the law, what is my obligation to, to give? You know, on and on and on and on. Let's, let me show you how one guy does this. I don't know him. I picked these people because I listened to what they had to say and I thought, okay, there's an example, okay? They all have great hair. Great word for you this week is found in Malachi chapter three, verse number ten. Watch his, watch, you, watch what he does. All the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. I want to focus on there shall be not enough room. You know, God doesn't want all your money, but He does want at least ten percent of it. We know that the te Old Testament verse here runs parallel with the order of Melchizedek in the book of Hebrews. Tithing is new covenant. And God expects that he, if he gives you the health and the expression to work and labor and bring money in, he believes that 10% of that should be coming into his house. That's what God wants, a minimum of a tithe. 
And when you're touched in your heart, obviously you can give more than 10% if he so chooses. But even in giving the tithe, here's what he says, I will bless you and there will be not enough room to receive it. Think about all the rooms in your house. You don't have enough rooms to put the blessing that God's going to give you. If you go rent a warehouse down somewhere down the block, and, you, and there won't be enough room in that warehouse. If you go whole rent a city block of buildings, there's not enough rooms in those buildings to put the blessing that God is going to give you. He said, there shall not be room enough to receive it. You and I don't have the square footage to put the financial blessing that God's going to give back to us if we simply peel off a tenth of all that we have and give it to Him. Ladies and gentlemen, partners and friends, there's no greater way to move into increase. There's no greater way to move into prosperity than to give out of what you already have. This isn't about working five jobs. It isn't about, you know, begging and borrowing and stealing your way to the top. It's about the secrets already in your hand. Begin to give 10% of that this year, and by the end, you won't have anywhere, no room anywhere, to put what God's going to give you back. That's your way into the increase. That's your way into prosperity for 2016. And that's your word for the week. God bless you. Well, just so you know, I have purchased a city block. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Actually, I think I'm going to preach that in my own church. We'll see what happens. You think it'll work, Fred? Nope. He says no. Uh, you're ready to give, right? All right, so my goal is not to make fun of the guy. My goal is to look at the, the technique he used, all right? So he read the text. Do you even know who Malachi is? I mean, from that teaching. Would you even know who Malachi is? Would you even understand who he's talking to? We have no background whatsoever, right? It, it starts to become less about a historically grounded, theologically uh, consistent message, and it's just wisdom, sort of like a book of sayings, and he pulled one out. Like the whole book is Proverbs, like the whole Bible is Proverbs, which it isn't. So he's trusting that you don't have that background and don't care, and he's assuming you're going to treat what he just said in his application as equal to what he just read in the Bible, and it's not. Let's, let me show you how it's not. What he did was he read the verse, right? And then he said this. These are some of the things he said. First, to prove to you that you should tithe, he said Melchizedek proves tithing is new covenant. Now, he's saying that because he knows somebody in the audience is smart enough to say Christians aren't required to tithe. The Bible is very clear about that. There's no tithing in the New Testament. Tithing is an Old Testament term. It's for people under the law. Christians aren't under the law. We don't have to tithe. That's a, that's a concept that's completely wrong in itself. But if you thought maybe you knew that, he's trying to convince you otherwise. Oh, no, no, Melchizedek is proof that tithing is new covenant. Um, <laughs> we'll get back to that. Church saints are commanded to give 10%, he says. Well, the tithe of the Old Testament wasn't 10%. It was about 23%. Did you know that? The tithe required for the Jew under the law when you add up all the tithes that are required, the total is about, it varied between 20 to 30% in a year. No one ever had to give just 10%, never, anybody. <laughs> I mean, in, in the sense of how God has required it. So that's a complete misnomer in itself. So there's the first thing, he, he's giving you a number that he made up for you that's not biblical. God is promising, whoops, sorry, one too many. He says, God is promising what? You can probably tell me what it said. It's not on the screen, it's on your body. I know. <laughs> I'm asking you to guess. You won't have enough room for all those blessings. Yeah, oh, it just, it, it's set up to automatically go. He's promising you that if you give, God will make you so rich that you won't have room for it all. Is that what God meant when he said that the blessings will be more than you can store up? No. So let's go through, let's do the step he never did, okay? So Hebrews, he mentioned Melchizedek, it's from, he's mentioning a teaching in the New Testament in uh, Hebrews. Melchizedek is taught in Hebrews as a picture of Christ, not a lesson on Christian tithing. There's no connection between the two. Yes, Melchizedek tithed, but that doesn't mean we are supposed to tithe because Melchizedek tithed. And in fact, that would violate one of the other errors we're going to talk about. Secondly, Israel was commanded to tithe, as I said, between 20 and 30 percent of their income, and you are not Israel. You're not under the law. You're not a nation of people descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You don't live in the Middle East. You are not Israel, and you're not under a law God gave to that group of people only, period. Thirdly, 
Israel was commanded to give their tithes to the house of God, which in the context of the Old Testament, which is where this is found, what is the house of God? The temple. Ain't no temple no more. There's nowhere, God's house is now what? Yeah, the body of Christ is the house of God, the temple of God. So there is no such thing as a house of God that you must take your tithes to anymore. There's no biblical requirement that your money go to any particular group of people, structure, organization, whatsoever. You can give it all to your church, you can give none to your church, you can give to whatever your heart is directed to do by the Lord. I assure you he will make sure that everything he wants to fund will get funded, including your church. Right? He's, he owns all the cattle on a thousand hills. He doesn't need us to figure out what to pay for. He will tell us what to do. And if we're actually following the Spirit, we'll give whatever amount to wherever, whenever, and he'll get everything done he wants to get done in that way. That's all he's asked us to do is walk in the Spirit, listening to him. But that rigorous style of do what Israel did becomes opportunity for someone who wants more than he's getting to demand that and appear to have the Bible's backing. Okay? The New Testament, therefore, never at any point in any part of the New Testament ever commands a Christian to give any particular amount to the church. And why did I say New Testament? Because there's no discussion of Christianity in the Old Testament. In other words, the only place you would go is the new for this question, because the only people that were commanded in the Old Testament were the Jewish people under the law. Now, my, now, by the way, am I suggesting you shouldn't give money to the church or to anyone else for that matter? Obviously, I'm not. What I'm saying is, don't let someone else tell you what the Spirit alone tells you. God promised Israel a spiritual a blessing. I guess it's set to automatically go. He promised them a spiritual blessing, not a financial blessing. There's nothing in that context, even though God starts by talking about their tithes, there's nothing in the context that says that they will be blessed financially. In fact, the context of Malachi says that they are suffering under a what? For having not given, they are suffering under a curse. curse. That curse was not merely about what they had in their bank account. It was a curse of drought. It was a curse of enemies attacking. There was a, a concept of them being abandoned by God in a way that showed that he had been displeased. And the reverse of that is to be blessed by God in all those other ways. And his point of using a storehouse was metaphoric. It was euphemism, right? It's saying, I'm going to bless your socks off. When I say that to you, do you worry that your socks are about to leave your body? We say things like that to make the point that it will be a great blessing, not because we literally want you to start treating the euphemism as reality, like this guy did, right? A sh he's a charlatan. I don't know who he is, but he's a charlatan. All right, let's go to the next one. Assume prescription. Um, let's start with a quick definition. A description. This is easy. It's whenever the Bible gives a telling of some events in the course of the narrative. Okay? Here's a simple example. David sent and inquired about the woman and said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David sent messengers and took her, and when she came to him, he lay with her, and when she had purified herself from her and cleanliness, she returned to her house. It's a description of David doing something he shouldn't do. All right? Would you then suggest that because David did it, you're sh sh allowed to do it? That Christians should be allowed? To, I mean, if David did it, after all. <laughs> he was a man after God's own heart. I mean, come on. But we know we shouldn't do this, and we know David's not called out in a, in a kind way for doing this. He's disciplined for doing this, right? So it's descriptive. It's description of David. What it is not, then, is prescription. A, a prescription is a biblical instruction or command or exhortation to the reader, telling us we need to do such and such. Here's an example. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, nor you shall you covet your neighbor's wife. David, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. All right, here's your prescription, and David's sin is a description. But it's funny how often this gets turned around by false teachers, right? That if Abraham tithed, you should tithe. In other words, somebody did it once, somewhere, therefore we always should do it all the time. That's turning description into prescription. Unless the Bible calls it out specifically and says we must do it, just because someone else did and it's described doesn't automatically mean it's a requirement. We need to look at the scripture overall and say, did it ever become a requirement for us at some point in some fashion? Let's see if I can get this to move here. Here's an example. Acts 16, 27. I've encountered this one quite a bit as I travel. It doesn't seem to be as common in our culture, but in some cultures this is a very common example of turning description into prescription. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors opened, he threw his, drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. This is when Paul is in the jail. 
and the Lord sets Paul free. And jailers in Roman times, if they let their prisoners go, they were killed themselves. So the jailer's going to kill himself. Paul, Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Paul and his friend didn't leave. And he called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Do you know what the answer that Paul is, what Paul gives them is the answer? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and you and your household. Let me, let me, this lady's a little annoying to listen to, but just. Then there is the scripture in Acts 16, 31. As Paul is answering this Philippian jailer, he says, oh, what shall I do to be saved? And Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, you and your household. Oh, what a promise. Not just for you, Those are her but sound effects. your household as well. I was so blessed one day. I was preparing a message, household salvation. I was preparing this message to give. And even as I was, the mail arrived and there was my magazine from Benny Hinn's ministry, and he had an article, Household Salvation, which in fact uh, was um, confirmation to go and give this message, and indeed trust the Lord for household salvation. Okay, so you notice any interpretation of the verse? None. <laughs> I mean, she moved to the application, right? Yeah. In fact, did she even, it's all hinted. And her great source, Benny Hinn, that should have told us up front there was going to be problems. But yeah. listen, look at what she did. She, so here's the verse. This is what the guy asked. Okay, so what's she implying? By the answer that Paul gave, what's she implying? Salvation. Household salvation. Do we even know what that means? in the way she's trying to use it. I mean, it, it's, a, it's not even a term we understand at this point, right? It seems kind of weird. It's she, she's implying that one person can believe and a, a bunch of other people get credit for heaven just because one person believes. Is that what she's saying? You know, we start, to, we start to wonder, is that actually what she's saying? She never actually explains anything. And then if I go look at the passage, look what it's actually saying. He says, after he brought them out and said, sirs, what do I have to do to be saved? Look what it says. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household, okay? And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in the house. And he took them that very out of the night and washed their wounds. Immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. All right, well, what would be the reasonable interpretation for what just happened? They were all preached to. They all got baptized. Pretty much the natural assumption is that between those two moments, they all did what? Believe. They all believed. Why would we not assume that? Isn't that the way it always works? Isn't that what the Bible says? All the other times we see this mentioned, right? Believe and be saved. Why would we suddenly assume that in this one moment, because Luke just happened to not mention that part of the process explicitly, why would we assume that in this case it never happened? That's the more bizarre way to understand this. The natural and easy way to understand it is, it's just like every other moment. Paul said to the man, look what he asked. He said in the earlier verse, look what he said. Well, this is the whole, the Bible itself says this is true, right? Let me break it down, though. He says, believe in the Lord Jesus, you will be saved, and you and all your household. Now, if we know that what the Bible says about salvation, someone interpret that verse to me in light of all Scripture. What's Paul explaining? He's saying to this guy, if you believe, you'll be saved. And what does Paul mean by the second half, you and your household? If they believe. Yeah, if they do the same thing, they can believe. Anyone can do it. It's the same process. You want to be saving? You know, think of it this way. If somebody said to you, I really would like to know the Lord so I can be saved, what do I have to do? Would you stop there? Would you say, oh, here's what you have to do, brother? Or would you might say, well, here's what you have to do, and let's go talk to your family, too. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's what Paul's mission was. And all he's saying to this guy is, the method is not crazy and hard. Anyone can do it. I'm you? making a prediction that comes true yeah. three verses later. Yeah, and it comes true, but we don't necessarily, this is where I say you have to look at something in its context, not just in its immediate context, but in the context of all scripture. 
How many people here have seen situations where one person gets saved in a family and that ends up being a trigger for other people to be interested, come to know the Lord, and it moves out from there? God's doing that work. I'm not saying it's purely mechanical. What I am saying, though, is we don't look at that and say, oh, there's some special promise in the Bible that if I believe, all my family will believe. I have some people who've come up to me at times in the past when I've te taught and they've said, Steve, I've believed and I can't, I'm waiting for God to fulfill this promise to me. And my family still isn't believing yet. And you see in their heart this this heartbreak and you just want to say I mean I don't even know where to begin I hope your family gets saved but you need to understand that you're, you're trusting in something that's not true whatever God does he'll do but it's not because you did something that something else has to happen it's not cause and effect it's not quid pro quo God does what he does so look what she did she took description Paul explaining to a certain Gentile person how you get saved and she turned it to prescription God has promised to save the family members of every Christian how many people in here have someone in their family who's not believing. So God is terribly unfaithful to that promise, isn't he? I mean, here's another example of just how easy it is to find bad teaching. It's clearly misusing the scriptures, and it's obviously contradicted by our own experience. Why do we see any reason at all to think it has any possibility of being true? Because we want it to be true. And if I can tell you something you want to hear, that's called tickling ears. Even if the thing I'm tickling you with is a good thing in its objective sense, you know, wanting salvation for people, that's a good thing. But if I manipulate the tr truth of Scripture to get you to be, you know, thinking something that's not true, then I've just turned a good thing into a bad thing. It is not true. And the text that they quote does not support it. All right, last one. This is a bit... Um, Unique. You won't see this happening all the time, and it takes some, you, you, you almost have to be a bit of a skilled stu a student of your own to pick up on it. But basically, anytime someone starts telling you the Greek or the Hebrew means such and such, and therefore this and that, take that with a grain of salt. Not because they're always wrong. Sometimes I'm wrong. Sometimes the text of Greek or Hebrew is hard to work with, and you're not sure, and you take a stab at it, and you're not quite right. That's fine. We all get things wrong. We'll, you know, we'll all figure that out in the end. But be careful about someone who takes you to some strange interpretation based on that process. And it feels off. Let me give you an example. Um, and I'll define it for you here first and then we can kind of understand it better. It's giving preference to rabbinical or other extra biblical sources like a, a historian like Josephus, giving that priority over scripture. Instead of interpreting those extra biblical sources through a lens of scripture, you flip it around and you interpret the, the Bible through a lens of these things. That's a dangerous, wrong thing to do. Or if someone discovers some novel and unbiblical theological concept that they tell you has been hidden in the text and we just never realized it, and common Bible students have overlooked it for eons, but suddenly, because they happen to know the text of the Hebrew or the Greek, they've suddenly discovered it. Here again, that's a dangerous precedent because Lots of biblical scholars who know Greek and Hebrew have looked at the whole Bible, and if you're suddenly finding something they didn't find, maybe it's because what you're finding is not consistent with what Scripture says, and you're making it up. All right? Uh, another one would be selectively or inaccurately drawing conclusions from the culture of the times. Like, here's what Jews used to do, or here's what the Greeks used to think, and therefore, we should take a different view of this text. That's not always wrong. In fact, sometimes that's very helpful, but you need to be sure that that person knows what they're doing. And whatever they conclude, it better not be something that is out, uh, outside of what Scripture supports generally, like household salvation or something weird like that. All right? Here's a text. Here's one of these cultural examples. Women keeping silent in church, right? So when we hear people teach on this, what you'll see is... So some taking it too far and some not going far enough. And in each, either case, they're doing it on the basis of culture. One would say, well, because the culture had this particular view, we can't take this view. Our culture views women differently and on and on and on. Yeah, but the, the Bible's written for all times for all cultures. God's not asking us to just cross out whole sections of it because we think differently than the Bible. On the other hand, the practices that Paul is asking for in Corinth were specific to what he saw going on in Corinth. And so we have to, have, to, have to ask ourselves, was he speaking prescriptively to the whole church or prescriptively to one church on the basis of some general principle that is prescriptive to the whole church? Does that make sense? So there can be a principle that's prescriptive for all of us and a particular uh, implementation of that principle that's unique in one case. A uh, good example in Paul's experience. Paul told Galatia, uh, Paul 
told Timothy to be circumcised, and he told the church of Galatia not to be circumcised. Well, which is it, Paul? What am I supposed to do, Paul? Well, neither are prescriptive to us. They're both prescriptive to an individual under certain circumstances. If we happen to be in the same circumstances that person was, then that would be prescriptive to us. But if we're not in the same circumstances that person, then it's not prescriptive to us. That's what I mean by context. Okay? This is one of those situations where you, I'm not going to teach on this. If you're waiting, I'm not going to. Um, but it's an example where you have to be careful how someone applies it, especially if they try to draw on culture as their reason. Culture does not automatically mean we don't take into consideration our culture or it doesn't mean that we automatically dismiss something either. Okay? Here's another one. Slaves. How many people have used this to say that slavery is biblical? And how many other people have turned around and said the fact that slavery doesn't seem to be condemned strongly enough in the Bible is proof that the Bible's not accurate or that it's not trustworthy? You know, you've, they've used it both ways. All right, let's... Let's go to this one. I want to, there's one example in particular in which you take the Old Testament Hebrew, and as you didn't, maybe you didn't know this, but the Old Testament was written in Hebrew for the most part, and the New Testament is written in Greek, ancient Greek. And because that's not the way we read, we read translations of these things, uh, I can go in and try to tell you what the original words were, and I can tell you something about how that language works, and then I can begin to tell you that it means something different than what our English is saying. And if I do that with enough skill, and you don't notice my little sleight of hand, I'll bring you to a conclusion that was never intended by the original text. Here's a very good example. Some of you may know this guy. You ask me today, Pastor Prince, if everything is done in our worship, is there anything that we bring to God? Well, Abraham gave us something here. And here is where some of you can go to sleep. All right? Because it's not for everybody. It's a special knowledge, not for I everybody. Said, this teaching is not for everybody. Abraham gave him a tithe of all. This was before the law, y'all. This was 450 years before the law was given on Mount Sinai. The Ten Commandments were not yet given. No one put a gun on, on, to, to uh, Abraham's head and said, give tithe. He didn't have to. Obviously, he had a revelation. And the word tithe here in Hebrew, here's where the Hebrew comes in. All right, means maser. Say maser. You see, I have the British accent. You know? Maser is spelled, by the way, the uh, Hebrew is read from right to left. This maser, mem, ein, shin, resh. Maser, reading from right to left. You see, the, the first letter there makes it a noun. Okay? Now, the last three letters, if you remove the noun, all right, you have the word aser. Aser, the last three letters. Aser means rich. The rich is in the tithe. Come on, people. It's a revelation. It is, it's not for everybody. It's not for everybody. <laughs> All right, so what did he just do? I don't even know. So he took a Hebrew word. Do we have English words that if you take a few letters off, it's a different word? Yeah, pretty much. Does it mean anything when we do that? If I can do that, does it mean anything? No. Okay, catacombs, I take off everything but cat. Does that mean there's some relationship between catacombs and cats? Or combs. Or combs. <laughs> it's just a, it's a happenstance of language. Sometimes roots have meaning, right? When you put a, a, a prefix or a suffix to a word and they do have a relationship. But then there's a lot of other times when just because of the vagaries of language and the way letters can be you know, mixed around in different ways, that you can have words within words, but they have no meaning entomologically. There's no relationship between them. But he certainly implied a relationship, didn't he? What did he just imply? What was the, he didn't say it overtly, but what did he say? If you tithe, then you will be If you tithe, become rich. Why is that a truth you get? Now, what text was he reading from? Genesis with Melchizedek again? Did, did we hear anything about Abraham getting rich because he tithes? In other words, I know that Abraham was wealthy, but the point is, where in the text did this come from? Nowhere. What did he do? He took one Hebrew word, showed you that through a, a coincidence of language, he could drop a letter and he has a new word, and those two words helped make a point he wanted to make, so he used that method. It's not biblical scholarship, it's manipulation. It's not the intent to, under to understand scripture or discover scripture's truth. It's an intent to have you, as the audience, do something he prefers. And I'm not... By the way, I don't know any of these people, as you probably know. I, I'm, I'm not 
making some broad statement about their ministries or their individual lives. I'm talking about their technique as it relates to these specific examples, and they're not alone. In fact, the ones who are really good at this, the, the princes, the um, uh, Duplantis, uh, uh, disciples of these guys, you know the ones I'm talking about? Copeland, Copeland Kenneth Copeland. Um, the ones who do this so well that they have their own private jets, mm -hmm. everyone else is trying to be like them. All the false teachers think, I want to do what that guy does. And what do they do? They study the methods and they, it's just like con men who figure out a new con and all the other con men try to copy that con. And all the people are being, you know, milked through this method because they're not doing anything of their own to look at that and say, wait a minute, you just did something with a text that's not sincere, it's not authentic, it's not genuine, it's not intentionally, it's not intended to be good, it was manipulative, it's, it's wrong, and if you don't repent of that, you're not my teacher anymore because I just see in you something I am very concerned about. Because I can tell you as a Bible teacher, I'd never do that. I'd know, even as I did it, I'd know what I was doing. How do you sleep with yourself if you do that? You'd be ashamed instead of being a workman that's dividing things rightly, right? And you don't get there overnight. So all I know is these guys started somewhere, they ended up somewhere. But their congregations supported them in it because their congregations don't call them on it. And when they get big enough, they don't need to worry anymore about congregations because they're insulated. We need to understand that this stuff's going on so we can help other people. I'm not so much worried that you guys are going to be the kind to fall for it because I think typically if you come here, you know better. Maybe not, but I hope so. But what we can do is help others. So when somebody else says, did you hear this teaching that says that if I get saved, my whole household gets saved? You need to be able to say, without just saying that's wrong, it's better to say, let's go look at that in the Bible together. Where did they get that again? Acts 16, let's go look at that. Read that to me again. Well, what do you think this means? What do you think that means? Show them through that example that we don't just understand things because someone told us. We understand things because of what we read in the Bible. And if it makes sense to us, meaning it's consistent with text of scripture overall, then we can be feeling pretty good. We know what it means, okay? So context, application without prescription or without interpretation, turning description into prescription and manipulating the words of text of scripture. This is the stuff that I think is most common today. I could have done this for another three hours with a bunch of other examples from other techniques. All right, I hope that's useful to you. Uh, we kind of ended right on the end of the hour, but we have a minute or two. If there's any questions, I can take a few questions. No, the slaves. When Paul says in, his, in Ephesians slavery. 5 about slavery, yeah. Thank you. Those are just examples of the way that there's opportunity in this text to take culture and to play with it. Where do you look up uh, your Greek and uh, uh, I use the, there are a lot of tools you can use these days online as well as things you can buy for yourself. Um, the classic one is Strong's Concordance. And uh, an online version of it is probably the easiest place to start. And just be careful. I mean, you, words have multiple layers of meaning. You, you can't just pick whichever one you think is intended. You have to know what the context requires. Come back in a second. Yep. How, how valuable is it to, to know that language when doing interpretation? And also, when you um, come to something confusing, do you, do you default to what the professional translator has said, or do you default to what it says? Well, all right, so let's back up. There is nothing you need to know from the Bible that requires you know Greek and Hebrew. There's nothing that you need to know that requires that you know Greek and Hebrew. There are subtleties of understanding that if you have background in those languages, or if you can use references that have that background, or if you study certain rabbinical sources that are not, that you can study with an understanding of what to filter, I mean, if you get to that point, well, then you'll get another nuanced level of understanding that might enhance your, your study, but it's not required. So be careful about someone who says, well, if you don't know Hebrew, you're not even getting half of what it says. That's nonsense. The fact that you're in the body of Christ is proof that you can get what you need. What, what I'm concerned about, though, are those who tell you that there's secret stuff you're missing. And then they know it, and you don't. And so you're dependent on them, like Pastor Prince said. This isn't for everyone, which immediately makes all of us want to hear it. Right? If it's not for everyone, ooh, it's special. I want to be part of that group. It's a technique. So, Steve, there are some situations where there's a word that's used... Like, for instance, propitiation. Propitiation, yep. Romans 3, 23-ish mm -hmm. or somewhere around there. 
and I'll use Strong's terms to find where that uses where that word is used right. elsewhere, and it's used in Hebrews about the right uh, so, so covering you, the atonement cover. So you and can so use I that. I understand that right. by the context. That's certainly an appropriate yeah, well, thing to do, and seeing where else that word is used in the Bible. To yeah, better understand that individual that's, word, Yeah, there's right? scholarly efforts that will depend on having that kind of tool, like a, a concordance. But what I want to be careful about is taking us down that road in this conversation. Yeah. This is a conversation about not doing that. Yeah. Not because it's wrong, but what I'm saying is not getting pulled into someone who says yeah. they're impressing you because they have all this knowledge of deep things you don't know, yeah. and that's now a requirement. Yeah. We have people like Kevin and others who can teach it in some of these deeper areas so that we can move ahead a little in our understanding. But that's an enhancement. That's icing on the cake. All right. All right. I'm le- got to let you go. You got a 15-minute break. Uh, one more question. I'll take one more in the back because you had your hand up earlier. I was just wondering, uh, <coughs> Abraham, when he offered uh, the Well, I would. And then he purposed in his heart to honor him, honor God that way. Or you're you're asking a deep question in a short time I have. So here's here's the here's my easy out. We cover that in the Genesis study. <laughs> <laughs> Plug it in, baby. <laughs> well, or I can add, you can talk to me later. Let's pray very quickly here, guys, as we go out. Sorry, Father, thank you for this opportunity. I pray, Father, that our hearts have been fair and kind in what we've been thinking and saying about these things, so that we would be better prepared that we're not. Uh, inclined, Father, to judge people, but rather methods, and in that uh, judgment, Father, be better equipped to divide rightly the word and to be protected from what is false. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.